so we'll get started. First, I want to find out who has had experience in consensus decision-making process. So maybe a third of the folks here, a quarter of the folks here. How many people have been frustrated by consensus decision-making <laughs> process? Okay, this is maybe around the same number of people. Um, who has seen it work well and have, all right, okay. Okay, very small groups. All right, that's helpful to know. Um, and then who's never, kind of never participated um, in consensus decision-making processes? Just, okay, so. Anyone here facilitate, have facilitated consensus? Okay, great. Okay, so there's gonna be, there's a wide range of experience here, and so I think part of it is gonna be learning, helping to learn from each other. I'm gonna do some very, very basic kind of broad brush strokes around consensus. Everyone does it differently. Um, also, there are like three to five day trainings on it. There are lifelong studies on consensus decision making. So this is an hour and a half and actually a little bit less now. So this is really just an introductory piece. I'm gonna try to go over the presentation materials a little bit quickly and to see if there's some kind of key questions that we wanna grapple with. Um, uh, so that's just kind of my beginning caveat. Um, I always think it's helpful to start with some basic ground rules. Um, uh, Autumn has already asked you to turn off your phones or put them on vibrate. Um, another thing that we're, I'm asking is um, respecting other people's opinions and experiences. Um, uh, please ask questions. If it's something that I'm gonna get to, I'll, I'll um, I'll say that, and if it's something that I'm, that's not gonna be part of the um, presentation, I'll probably mark it down as something, if we have time, we'll discuss it further, um, or if it's a quick answer, I'll, I'll answer it. And then uh, a ground rule around stepping up and stepping back. If you find yourself talking a lot, um, I ask maybe to kind of wait for other people to, to chime in, or if you find yourself um, you know, having a lot of thoughts but not sharing, maybe kind of push yourself to to participate um, more. Anything else that anyone wants to add in terms of how we want to kind of share the space and agreements that we want to have with each other? I'm just amusing myself when you just note some of the questions because I know I'm not talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, anyone else? Anything else? Okay, great. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm recording. If that's a problem, okay. then I can do it. Okay, well, so there's going to be video recording, video audio recording, and then Nick also is going to be recording on his phone. Great. Great. Um, wonderful. So, what is consensus? Um, let me first start out by saying that there are many different ways of making decisions. So, consensus is one way of making decisions. Let's just explore some kind of basic categories of decision making. Um, I, might, I might ask for volunteers to help put kind of put these other places <laughs> if that's all right. On the door is fine. Thank you. Okay, so here's a bunch of lines and dots. Um, uh, the top part kind of shows, come on in. Mm -hmm. Welcome, welcome. Um, so this shows uh, kind of a diagrams of representing different kinds of decision making processes. Um, what does the first one up here look like to you? A, a dictatorship, a pyramid, autocratic. autocratic. So it shows kind of one person at the top making all these decisions, impacting all these people, right? Um, so yeah, that's what's an example, a real life example of that? Parents. Parents. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Lots of kids. So um, what about? Uh, well, this might be a, a single parent. Um, what does the next one show? <laughs> I don't know, boy network is 
one way of, of seeing that. So it's an oligarchy where you have a, a mm -hmm. small group of people, maybe not one person, a small group of people making decisions for a whole host of other people. Um, any particular example of that? The Federal Reserve. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's another example of a, another hierarchical decision-making model. And uh, it, there's no formal term. It's a layered, kind of multi-layered hierarchy. Um, what, what does that look like? Where, like where, 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 yeah. uh, where yeah. a lot of people work, right? right? There's a boss, and then there's these other managers, and then, um, and then uh, a, a host of workers. Um, so, so then here are, are maybe less hierarchical models. <laughs> what is the first one? What, what do you think that is? Scattered. Chaos. 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 Some people think that, you know, this, this is, um, this could be a good way to go. It's unstructured. Um, but what I find is that this actually has a tendency to become hierarchical where whoever has the most information or the most time to implement things um, tend to make, have more power and make more decisions. Um, so if it's not defined or structured, um, unless it's a very unique set of folks, um, that, that tends to go in that direction. What about this one? What's that? It's very pretty. <laughs> Circle. That's the buddy system. So this is what some people think is consensus, where everyone agrees, like everyone has like full agreement, unanimity. So this is unanim unanimous. And it's very difficult to make decisions in this way unless you're a very small group of people with a lot of alignment of values, of trust. Um, so uh, I, I, I haven't seen that in action. I don't, I believe that it exists, but just to kind of let folks know that that is you know, one way that often people conceive consensus, and the last one um, is, you guessed it, consensus, um, or is a, is a representation of it, um, showing that people are different, right? They might have different feelings and concerns, and, um, and it doesn't mean that everyone fully agrees. Um, you don't have to have full agreement to have consensus, and we'll describe that in a little bit. Um, so, how about somebody taking a stab at, um, sorry to use a, a violent metaphor, taking a try at um, a definition of consensus? What, is, what, what are elements of it? You don't have to come up with a full one. A, d a process, a decision-making process. Compromise. Compromise. Communication. Communication. Good for the group. Good for the group. Everyone gets heard. Everyone gets heard. Great. Takes a long time. <laughs> yes, that is true. Um, so here's one definition of consensus that I thought was helpful. Um, if if you don't have a sense of what that is, let me just take this down. I have a PowerPoint, but I I feel like I like kind of real paper. <laughs> so I hope you. Bear with me. Does someone who want to read that out loud? Consensus is a process for group decision making. It's, it is a democratic method by which an entire group of people can come to an agreement. <sighs> the input and ideas of all participants are gathered and synthesized to arrive at a final decision acceptable to all. Through consensus, we're not only working to achieve better solutions, but also to promote the growth of community and trust. So it's, it's really has two functions, right? It's to make decisions, but it also has this other function of building community in the process. Um, so if you want efficiency, quick, and this is not as not very important, then you might want to choose a different kind of decision making process. Um, so uh, just a couple of things. It, it is, it's about cooperation, not competition. Um, it uh, intends to be participatory and inclusive, not about majority rules. Um, and it takes time. It's not expedient. 
and um, it's democratic and it's not um, unanimous, like um, was mentioned earlier. So what are, why, why, why use consensus decision making if it takes time? And some, of, some of you spoke to some of that stuff. But. Covered most of these here. Right. 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 So it shares both kind of the responsibility and kind of the power. So both power and responsibility. So here are a, a couple things, um, many of which you've mentioned already. Um, so it allows people to collectively explore solutions until the best one for the group emerges. It ensures that everyone has a voice in the decision making. Um, it synthesizes all ideas into one. Right? It takes all the different ideas. Um, uh, it, another thing is it brings conflicts into the open. Um, if you are just kind of, you can kind of quietly, you know, in some majority rule situation, you can go and kind of organize a bunch of people and they don't have to say anything, but at the end when there's a vote, you just say, oh, I don't want this, right? Um, but, but the process of consensus really brings all the issues out onto the table to be discussed. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how that happens in a minute. Um, allows for minority opinions and concerns to be heard and considered. It creates a space for decisions to be thoroughly thought out. So it, uh, part of the time that it takes also allows for um, good thinking. Um, it encourages cooperation. Um, it promotes solidarity, all our winners. Um, it minimizes domination and it promotes commitment to carry out the decisions. So, um, getting into what it looks like um, and how it works, I'll uh, just go through one way um, that we use here at the Eco Village and I've seen used. Um, again, there are kind of varieties of consensus decision-making processes, um, but I'll show you one way. Consensus, it, it, you either start with some kind of discussion of an issue Sometimes it starts with a proposal. Someone has thought about something and wants to bring it to a group, but somehow a discussion and a proposal happen, right? Um, you want to make sure everyone understands once it gets to the proposal stage that everyone understands. So you make sure you have, before people get into the merits of it, it's really hard if some people are getting into the why it's a good idea or not a good idea and half the people are like, I still don't understand. What do you, what do you mean by this or that? So it's like really important that everyone understands first. <coughs> um, and then kind of the core process of consensus is, um, is addressing concerns, right? You can, you know, pe people can kind of make your, the case of why it's a you know, good idea and why they support it. But you really want to make sure you address concerns. If there are no concerns, once a proposal is made and everyone understands it, and there are no, you ask if there are any concerns, if there are no concerns, you have consensus. Right? Um, if you have concerns, the idea is that you try to address them one way or the other, whether it's some people want to just feel heard, and so they want to raise it. They won't necessarily you know, stop something from moving forward, or they, you know, they want to kind of warn folks or um, but other concerns are things that you know might need to be addressed. Um, either there are pieces of the proposal that are missing, or that it conflicts with something. And so you go through that process um, of addressing concerns, and um, you allow a certain amount of time. And, and this this varies in different groups. And then you can call the question. Um, once you've had an adequate um, discussion. Um, you call the question and to find out are there, are there, um, are, if there are no concerns after the discussion and after the proposal is maybe adjusted to address those concerns, um, then it goes to consensus. There may be times where it's not something that is either addressable or the discussion really didn't feel like it um, addressed a particular concern. There are different kind of ways that you can go with that. If you still have an outstanding concern, you can go to kind of this level of, 
I'm not really in support of it, or I have some reservations, or I will stand aside, which means I'm not going to participate in it, but I'm not going to stop the group from moving forward. Um, so those, that means that you have consensus, but those need to be recorded um, um, as, as non-supports. Um, the way that you can stop a decision from moving forward is with a block, and then you have no consensus. And I'll talk about blocks in a second. Um, Another piece that we don't have on our uh, usual diagram is the implementation part, and I think that's a really important key to kind of building community, is that you, if you go through this whole process, spend all this time you know, wrestling with this thing, and it doesn't get implemented in the end, I think that kind of starts to divide and create um, fractures within a community or a group. So, um, so that is a very important piece to kind of building um, and, and also you learn from that, right? When you can come, come back to learning and addressing and, and improving upon how, how, how things work. Um, here, let me talk about blocks. How many of you have either experienced or blocked a consensus decision-making process? Okay. So, um, so you, you've seen that. Different groups really define blocking and allow for blocking in different ways. Um, but a couple of the things that many groups have in common are these. One is that it must be based on the group's needs and values, not on personal preference. It's, it's, it, uh, most groups don't allow, oh, I just don't like that. I don't like the color blue, so I just, you know, um, so I don't want you to paint it or whatever. But it has to be kind of based on the group's needs and values. And, um, and, and this reason must be fully articulated and understood. It do, people don't have to agree with it, but it needs to be articulated. That kind of brings that, the conflicts out into the open um, point in that you can't just say, I, I just don't like it. Um, that there needs to be some articulation. Like I, like I believe that it goes against kind of the values in such and such ways. Um, or kind of, this is what we're about and this seems to be bringing us in a different direction. Um, another thing is that they shouldn't happen that often. And some of the things it might show is that if it's happening often, is that it could mean that your group might need more training to have kind of common understanding around consensus process. Um, it might mean that your group needs clear goals and values that you're all kind of upholding. Um, if, if that's not clear, it's really hard to kind of base the decisions on the same kind of ground and foundation, right? So there, that could cause a lot of disagreements. And if it tends to be the same person in the group um, over and over again, it might just mean that it's not a fit. It's, it's not a judgment one way or the other. It just might mean that that person kind of has a very different set of values or assumptions than, than the rest of the group. So um, that that happens. To give a, a little bit more nuance as to where somebody is, if, if everyone's kind of mediocre, it's good to know that. If everyone's like, if there's half the group that's super excited about something and the other one's like, ah, you know, it's just, or really strongly, you know, have big concerns, it's just good to know. Like if, so here, sorry. Um, so uh, this version shows that one is um, that I am, yes, in support. This is great. Um, two is I find it perfectly acceptable. I have no problems with it. Three, I can live with the proposal. It's not that exciting. I'm not enthusiastic about it, but it's fine to go through. Um, four is I don't fully agree with the proposal and need to register my view about why. However, I do not choose to block the decision. I'm willing to support the proposal because I trust the wisdom of the group. So that's um, somebody kind of willing to kind of step aside from that. Um, five is uh, here is a block. I do not agree. Oh wait, hold on a second. Oh yeah, I do not agree with the decision and feel the need to stand in the way of this decision being accepted. And then uh, a closed fist is I feel we have no clear sense of unity in the group. We need more work before consensus can be reached. So there's a lot more group work to be able to even kind of get back into this. So that that just helps give a sense of like if. There's a bunch of, if everyone's a three, except for the person who's you know, proposing it, 
that person might just be like, oh, okay, people aren't really that into it. Maybe we're not going to have buy-in. We're not going to have a lot of follow-through. Um, let's, let's reconsider. Give me a kind of an issue and not a, t a really complicated one that's taken kind of multiple meetings and hours and hours and headaches. Something fairly light to, to give an example. What's an issue or think of a recent Leaving decision? The Leaving the toilet seat down. <laughs> Let me hear some other ones, and, and, and we, might, we might come back to that one. What to eat for dinner. What to eat for dinner. So there's going to be a collective dinner, what to eat for dinner. Is that okay if we go with that one? Sure, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think that's an interesting one. I have thoughts on that one. Um, so uh, uh, what to eat for dinner. What kinds of things will come out in a discussion? Vegan or vegan. People who are vegan, people who aren't vegan. vegan. Allergies, food allergies, time, cost, time, cost mm -hmm. right? Who will, Who will do the cooking? Location, Location. where are we going to be eating? Parking, Parking if, if, if that's an issue related to location, right? So um, maybe someone come up with uh, just a scenario of what a proposal might look like. Let's make spaghetti. Okay, let's make spaghetti. Um, and there will be, let's say, a committee of people who are going to make the spaghetti. Um, the, the, share, the costs are going to be very low, so, but people, everyone will share the costs. And we'll have it um, at your house. <laughs> let's say that. <laughs> um, all right. So what kind of clarifying questions might you have if that's the proposal? Uh, what's the pasta? What kind of pasta? What's in it? What kind of what's in the sauce? Are there any chunky tomatoes? Are there chunky tomatoes? The key question of the of the key question. Are there going to be more? Is there going to be more than one type of sauce? Are there two types of sauce. Will there be wine? And will there be wine? <laughs> right. 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 So well, let's say we clarify that there's going to be two types of sauce, one that's vegan and one that um, is not. I'm not going to elaborate more on that. Um, let's say one is going to be a wheat-free pasta and a, a wheat-full pasta. And, um, and sorry, what was the other thing? Wine. And there it will be plenty, wine aplenty. Um, everyone's going to, everyone who wants to bring wine will bring wine. So um, let's say that that kind of clarified the thing, right? It's it's both a clarifying question that both clarifies like what was the proposal, but also adds adds to it. Like, is there going to be wine? Is there, you know, um, that could add to it, right? Are there concerns? Um, where's everyone going to sit? Where's everyone going to sit? Six chairs, so we have to sit on the floor. Okay, so yeah, they're, they're, we're going to have to sit on the floor, and so and we had pasta last week. Is there going to be other Right. Mm. I don't drink wine, so what am I going to drink? <laughs> Who's going to clean up? Okay. Yeah. Um, so those are both. Those kind of come back to concerns and also, you know, ask questions that haven't been fully fleshed out. Um, we'll assume that we had all these discussions and we have a fully more fully fleshed out thing. But f to address the concerns, what are I, what are ways that some of those concerns can be addressed? So, for example. Space, space. We're all gonna have to sit on the floor. We can eat here. <laughs> that could be. That's an adjustment, right? A v revision to the proposal. Sounds good. Um, how about the the concern about we ate pasta last? We already mm -hmm. ate pasta last night. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. How how strong how strong of a concern is that? <laughs> um, the concern about what about other beverages? What are ways of addressing that? I would say yes. Let's have other beverages. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> Wine and beer. Right. Um, so. <laughs> um, so. I guess we, let's say we've kind of talked about this to the level that this discussion kind of requires. Um, and 
let's say, and, and that happens in a couple of ways. One is you agendize the, the issue and you just try to fit within that discussion time based on how important you think that is or not important, right? How quickly. And so you kind of call the question, right? And you say kind of, are there still any outstanding concerns? And someone could say, I still have an outstanding concern. It's still, you know, I'm kind of sick of pasta. Are you willing to kind of let the group go forward? Are there, is this a concern that's strong enough that you believe is kind of based upon a value of diversity of food that the group already agreed to <laughs> that, that you're going, you know, that you can articulate the, that you would block the decision? Um, or maybe you can say, oh yeah, I, I have reservations, or I'll stand aside, oh I can't make it anyway, or you know, whatever, Some, something to kind of like allow the group to move forward, um, and then you have consensus, and then you want to make sure again, pizza, ha I mean, uh, pasta happens. Um, and that you eat. Um, I, I know that was a very light kind of decision. Um, was that helpful to illustrate kind of how that would go through? Anyone who still has kind of outstanding questions of what that process looks like for vote, those of you who haven't seen it before. Depends on what kind of, the way, the way that it plays out. Sometimes that, that's an important question. Some people say, who's going to do what? Um, some people will raise that as like, oh, last time it didn't happen because we didn't figure out who it was. Sometimes it's kind of like, okay, we're going to um, move forward and then kind of there could be like, oh, this committee is going to figure, a committee or a person or whatever is going to figure out the implementation piece. Um, I guess it, it depends on a variety of factors. If, you're, um, if you have time in the, the group, if, um, if it's already clear who's, you know, it's a committee proposal or something like that, I think it depends. I think that it's, uh, a ver it's very important to have facilitation, um, uh, good facilitation for the process of consensus. If it's a very small group, I mean, this is, this is kind of formal, uh, kind of a workshop and a conversation about formal consensus. There could be informal consensus where you don't need facilitation. There's maybe three of you and then you kind of make decisions you know, there's a high level of trust and you say, oh, let's do this. Okay, you know, let's do it, right? Um, this is more for kind of groups that need a little bit more structure and formal consensus, if that's, if that's helpful. Or a group that maybe have new people coming together, even if it's a small group, that, that this could help. So, yeah. Um, Autumn? What happens if you're talking about something and you've gone over your agenda time and it looks like it's gonna go on forever? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Right yes, so um, so the question, did everyone hear the question? Um, so you can do a number of things. Um, generally, I feel like because it, it, it depends, right? If it's a time sensitive thing and that something's going to happen one way or the other in a, in a, before the next time you meet, you might either ask for extra time on the agenda and say, can we, can we get through this? Um, it, it's very it's very conditional depending on what what is going on. If it's a very important thing and that you're really trying to build, like it's a heavy heavy decision, um, then you build more time in, or you say, okay, we're going to continue this in the next the next you know time we meet. Um, so yeah, I don't know if other people have other um, uh, thoughts on that. So um, I'm just wondering, so when there's concerns, then do you go back to the beginning of the process with each concern, discussion, proposal, clarifying for each concern? Yeah, there's different ways of addressing concerns. Um, so a couple, again, depending on the type of uh, issue you're talking about, it could be that you kind of revamp the proposal to try to address all the concerns, right? I wouldn't necessarily go through it with every single concern, kind of go through the same process over and over again with the different concerns separately. One of the things that, um, that I've seen work well is that you list, have a list of concerns. Um, you can try to address them. You could even kind of rank them to see, like if it's a really long list of concerns, which ones are kind of important for the group, and then kind of tackle those first, and then come up with some ideas and see if there is if there's kind of where there is already agreement, it's really important to, um, even though it's very based around concerns, to kind of identify where there's already agreement. So you can kind of build off of that, the place of agreement. Um, so you can, people say, okay, well, 
everyone's good with the food, but the location hasn't been figured out. Let's, okay, let's, are we consensed on the food, right? And so you can say, yes, we, you know, we can go through this process with consensus. So let's, if, if you need to break it down to seeing where you have um, agreement and then kind of going through the concerns either one by one or as a group depending on, again, how much time you have, how important those are, mm -hmm. um, if they're related concerns. In my experience, is always that any proposal can be changed and adjusted. Mm -hmm. um, and what we'll do is make sure that people know that if it's a, just a discussion or an introduction to an idea, mm -hmm. right? If it's something really kind of new, you don't necessarily want to make the decision on the same day. Um, if it's kind of a big policy, for example. Um, so, um, you know, someone will say, well, okay, this is what I'm going to be proposing. It's a discussion. Or it could say a discussion and possible decision if it looks like there's general agreement. Usually have a sense of the group, depending on your group, um, uh, where, how controversial something might be. Sometimes it's, it's hard to test, you know, to tell ahead of time. But. People have used different variations on consensus. I'm gonna just hold this up, actually. Um, consensus orient, um, what people call consensus oriented decision making, right? Um, there is this thing called consensus minus one or two or three, depending on how big the group is. If you have five people, you don't necessarily want to have consensus minus three. What that means is that you can still have one person who's not on board who would block, but you, but it, um, but it actually requires more than one, um, or two or three, depending on the size of the group, right? Um, knowing that that's not, I mean, so it depends on the nature of your group and how you know flexible you want to be, how how much kind of commitment to consensus, pure consensus you have. Um, there's also a uh, consensus blocking um, uh, that requires a validation. So that's what we do here, is that if someone blocks, we have to have another person who doesn't necessarily agree with the block, but that can validate it, saying that, okay, that person articulated it based on a group value and not an individual preference. Mm -hmm. And so that block is validated, and so it goes through. Um, so that's another variation. There's also kind of a supermajority fallback um, after sufficient um, discussion. And we actually have that for some time sensitive dis um, decisions here at the Eco Village, um, uh, where th we make sure that there's a sufficient time and we kind of codify it. Um, I believe it's like two different meetings in a certain amount of time. And, um, but certain time urgent decisions, um, we have a fallback, so if we need to pass a budget, for example, that we have a supermajority fallback. Um, so I don't know, do you all have kind of other different variations? Have you? Does Robert's Rules of Order work? So Robert's Rules of Order, I would say, is not a consensus process. It's, um, uh, there are some, you know, little kind of some overlap, right, friendly amendments and that kind of thing, but it's really, if you, I mean, I'm not an expert on Robert's Rules of Orders, but it seems it's a lot more rigid. It's kind of like you take a proposal or not, and the person who pr bring, brings the proposal forward has a lot of control over whether or not that gets changed or not changed, and then people vote yes or no, right? So it, it may or may not address people's concerns. It may or may not have kind of everyone's thought incorporated into it, if that, if that makes sense. But that, I think that's a whole, a whole other discussion. Um, some essential ingredients to consensus decision making. Um, something that was mentioned before, common goals and values. Um, and some of that stuff, you know, is helped by kind of stating norms, being very clear what kind of how things, what the, or, the organizational or group culture is, and having orientation for new folks, right? So people can kind of it's hard to participate in a system that you don't fully understand. So I think that that's helpful. Um, healthy communication, right? listening, um, and space for diversity of styles, right? Everyone communicates in different ways. Um, so some people, it takes some time to speak up, right? They need a little bit of silence in order to kind of break in. Um, other people are kind of ready to just <laughs> enter into any, in, any moment but other people need some time for that. So I think it's really important to kind of recognize those different kinds of communication. Training and practice, 
um, uh, recognize we're not going to get it all kind of figured out. And even after some time, we need to kind of relearn things and remind ourselves how to, how to move um, things forward. Um, trust and openness, and that's a really important one and also a hard one, um, kind of building that trust and building an openness. If there is a sense of mistrust and assumptions of where somebody else is coming from, that, it, that they're motivated by something that you're suspicious of, then no matter what they say, it's going to be hard for you to hear that kind of at face value, right? And so you might have a lot of concerns that are built out of a suspicion rather than something that's being said in the, in the, in the proposal. So um, that's, that's really kind of an important piece. Um, some of the experience here um, we've had around um, kind of people coming to the meeting with a decision already made around something, right? So there isn't that openness to hear an adjustment to the proposal. So they're here ready to either block or ready to kind of um, react to anyone who has concerns because they really, really want it to happen. Um, and that, that can be very detrimental to kind of the community building and the trust building and consensus building. Um, so where I, we found that if there's an openness on the part of a like a, somebody who's proposing something, are super in favor of something um, uh, like membership. Let's say somebody is applying for membership and somebody's super excited about that person. And any, if somebody raises a concern and the person who's really in favor of that person becoming a member says, is just like constantly responding and like really kind of shutting that other person down or not really listening and kind of showing empathy, it's hard for that other person who has a concern to back down. So they're going to say, no, I'm still like, I, my concerns aren't being addressed. But if if that person's like, oh, you know, or uh, if people who are for a particular person becoming a member, um, they'll they'll be able to feel like, okay, I'm I'm being heard, and and you know, this is going to be addressed one way or the other. There might be an openness, right? So I think it kind of happens in all directions. Sufficient time. Um, you want to make sure as you're building your agenda is that you have enough time for. Um, the issue, especially if it's an important or deep one or something controversial. You don't want to be kind of on this time clock where you're like, okay, come on, people, um, and cutting people off because that's also hard. Um, clear process and good facilitation. So that answers uh, your question. And sorry, active participation. And, and also clear on who makes what decisions, right? Um, if you've worked in big groups, um, sometimes it's really hard to do um, consensus with the whole group for all the issues. We used to make consensus-based decisions on um, what color to paint a particular place, and you don't want to have paint color <laughs> discussions <laughs> with a big group of people. It's just really, really hard to do, and it's like low stakes. It's something that you can just say, this particular small group of people or this one person, you know, go run with it. Um, um, unless kind of aesthetics or art or, you know, you're a group of artists and you, that's important. Um, but that, that wasn't the case here. Um, you have adequate time, that you have a presenter, um, and then you have clarified what type of item it is, if it's a discussion, if it's a decision, if it's an introduction, if, if it's an announcement. Um, so people kind of understand that and you as a facilitator are, are prepared um, for what that is. Um, you want to have some clear meeting roles. Not all of these roles are, are um, used in all kinds of meetings, but um, important to have a facilitator. Um, important to have um, a note taker, um, or at least some way of recording what decisions get made. Um, we used to not do that, and it was really hard to remember. Everyone had a different memory of what a decision <laughs> that was made the week before. No, we didn't decide that. So, yeah, that mm -hmm. is really helpful to to know, like you don't have to have kind of word for word discussion notes, but at least the decisions and any kind of, if anyone volunteered to do something. No. Right? Um, uh, we often ask for timekeepers because that'll help us get to all the agenda items. Um, we'll have a scribe, somebody to, to write notes, um, to write, you know, kind of shorthand summaries of the conversation. It's helpful for some people um, I'm a very visual person, so it's helpful for me to be able to kind of remind myself like all the different things that were said. Um, 
it's also helpful for, uh, from a pers facilitator's perspective, because sometimes in a group, or any, any group uh, participant's um, perspective, sometimes in a group some, you'll hear the same thing said over and over again, and if you write it up, sometimes it, it, it helps that um, kind of circular conversation, because then people are like, oh, that was said. Um, sometimes you want a vibes watcher or peacekeeper. Has anyone have ex ex had experience with a vibes watcher or peacekeeper? Yeah. So a couple of experiences around that. Um, so, Can you it? so what um, what the role of that person is is to get a sense of the kind of the feelings and emotions in a room, right? Um, so if it seems like everyone people are getting really tense and the facilitator is really focused on kind of how do we grapple with these like you know con you know concerns and and keeping stack and that kind of thing, um, a vibes watcher can say, hey, it seems like there's a lot of tensions and people are interrupting each other. Maybe we could just take a just quick breath or, or take a stretch break or something like that. And it helps kind of reset the, the I'm sorry? No, I said to avoid violence. To avoid, yeah, sure. <laughs> to, to kind of, you know, remind ourselves, okay, we're, we're, where we are, what we're, what we're trying to do here together. Who takes stack? So who takes stack? Okay, that's, yeah, so a couple meeting tools here. Stack, does everyone know what stack is? That means um, <coughs> figuring out who has their hand raised and who's going to be who's going to help be speaking next, right? So um, in different groups, it's done differently. Um, I uh, it, here at the Eco Village, the facilitator generally keeps stack unless it's unless it's hard to, and then they'll ask somebody to help them. Um, and scribing too. Some, sometimes a facilitator would will scribe, and other times you'll ask for a scribe. Um, and kind of any of these things, you don't generally don't note take and facilitate at the same time. But some of the other, some people are really good at keeping time and facilitating. I'm I'm not one of those people. Um, it's helpful to have meeting agreements and ground rules, just to kind of remind ourselves how we want to be with each other in the room. And it's also helpful for this facilitator to say, hey, you know, um, this is not just me, but we've made this agreement to do this thing, and you know, I'm asking you to do that. So that that's it's helpful to have that. Um, so other meeting tools. So there's stack. So keeping track of who's who raised their hand, who's up next to speak. Um, participation and listening exercises sometimes is helpful. Um, you know, sometimes your meetings are at the end of a work day, so everyone's a little bit frazzled. So sometimes it's helpful to have some kind of exercise to kind of like become present in the room and kind of learn how to. So one one example of that is like, um, you know, everyone pair up and one person talk how your day was just for one minute and the other person just listen, right? And then, and then you'll switch just so that you can kind of practice like fully being there in the, in the space. Uh, go arounds are helpful to equalize participation depending on the size of the group, depending on the issue, right? And in general here we have, when we have membership decisions, we make sure everyone has something, you know, they could just say, oh, I, two thumbs up or whatever, but to make sure um, that everyone has a say. Small groups, if it's a particularly large group or if you have a lot of people who don't speak up in the bigger group, then it's good to have small groups to, to talk out some, some issues. Brainstorms, everyone knows what brainstorms are. Yeah. Fishbowl is an interesting exercise. Um, Fishbowl is where you have a couple people in the, in the middle of the room and everyone else listens and observes that conversation. And it could be helpful in a couple of ways. One is if there's an issue that two people are really kind of good representat representatives of the different positions, the, or two or three, they can have a conversation that goes a little bit deeper so it's not like you have five people on stack and everyone talks about something different, that you can actually have a conversation and people can listen to that. Another, time, another situation was where this was um, through where I was working, where we had a conversation with all the women in the group, got into the middle and talked about how kind of gender issues had played out um, and affected, um, affected them. And the men listened, and then the men got into the middle of the room and, and talked about what they heard. So that was just a kind of an interesting way to break through some listening between an intergroup um, peers. Um, yeah, there are different ways that you, that you can use fish bowls. Um, straw poles are one way. It's, it's not, it's just a way to get a sense of the room. How many people are, you know, whatever, four, 
are okay with spaghetti, you know, and just get a sense of like, oh, only two people are, then you have to get a sense of like how much more you need to talk, right? Um, and it's not a vote. It's not a decision. It's just to get a sense of the room, right? Sometimes people think, get confused and think that that's a, a vote. Oh, everyone voted, or like the majority voted for it, so why aren't we doing it? It's, it's, it's just to get a sense. And you can do it with hand signals. You can do a body charting where you have agree, disagree, feel strongly, don't feel strongly, and you stand in the place in the room um, where you, where you, how you feel about it, right? So it's like, I feel really strongly about spaghetti. I'm going to stand in that corner. Or I really hate it, and then they stand in that corner, or whatever. And it's interesting to kind of just get a visual, visual feel of where people are. There's dot voting in terms of like there's a list of ideas, and people can get everyone gets like three dots, and you go up and you say, I want to do these. I should we should prioritize these three activities for the community or for the group. Um, so you can get a sense of that. And then parking lot, we call it bike rack, is where. Eco village, um, which is issues that come up that we don't have time to address but are important, right? That you write, you write, you have a list of things that you need to get to, but it's not on topic. Um, okay, so with that, are there, I'm going to get to these questions. Are there other questions that people want to raise and discuss? Huh. Okay. I, I'll answer that quickly. Um, so I've seen it work in kind of a small group as, as you want. To, I've seen it work with 300 people um, where it was a direct action um, around um, the World Bank and WTO in Washington, D.C. And there was clarity. There was real clarity around what we were there doing together. Um, and the the way that things were organized were in affinity groups. So you were in a group with people that you trusted or that you knew or had something shared, you know, like there's an affinity group that people want to do some theater, right? So you form an affinity group. And there's a representative from those, each of all those groups, right? So there's, you know, dozens of affinity groups in the room. And, a, and each of those has a representative. And then, and then there's a consensus process with that representative. Sometimes they'll say, okay, I need to go caucus with my group, so go back and have a discussion and get some feedback and come back. But um, there was, it was amazing. Um, I thought, wow, this, this worked. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, but it took a lot of skilled facilitation to kind of keep people on track and, and kind of work through if there's concerns or questions to not let that, um, Kind of stop the whole process but kind of figure out ways of working through those these are all kind of it depends <laughs> um i i think i i believe in having as many people knowing how to facilitate as possible it's not going to be everyone's strength um but if everyone goes through facilitation training and or everyone helps to facilitate uh, a meeting you become a better participant because you know what it takes and you're kind of seeing kind of a role of holding the group <laughs> um, rather than being a participant and making sure that you're kind of expressing your own um, uh, opinion or feelings. Um, I think that um, the facilitator should not be somebody who feels very strongly about that particular issue or has a lot of information to present apologize for all of the hanging hanging charts um, so if um, for two reasons even if you're a really skilled facilitator and you can stay pretty neutral in your role as facilitator if there's a perception that you're not neutral it's hard to have a conversation um, and it's sometimes it's hard to tell how neutral you're being um, I, I I was in a situation where I was so worried about appearing neutral that I was actually going I was facilitating against kind of where my interest was because I wanted to not seem <laughs> biased. So, I, I, and, and then I was kind of not <coughs> listening to the people who actually I agreed with and kind of like not letting them speak as much. So it, it does have a lot of um, interesting drawbacks. So if you feel strongly about it, if you want to participate, you should, you should just be, you should participate. Um, the way that we organize here is that we have a group, um, a facilitator, facilitator teams. So we have groups of two people and it rotates. Every Monday, we have meetings every Monday nights, 
and um, and we have I think 14 um, facilitators, so seven teams, and so uh, a different team. They'll one person will take notes and the other will facilitate. Sometimes they'll switch mid meeting depending on the issues, um, and we have regular facilitation trainings um, for folks. Um, and again, I think it depends on it depends on the group. Um, I think some. <laughs> I think it's just gonna come down. Thank you. Um, do you do you have a particular question or concern in that question of who facilitates? Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's. If you have a group of people and someone's interested in learning how to do it, I think that's, that's good. Um, one thing that we do a lot, and I didn't put it in here, is um, meeting evaluation. At the end of our meetings, we always have some kind of evaluation to give ref reflecting back on what worked and what didn't work in a meeting, um, both for the facilitator and also you know, for participants. Some people will say, oh, I noticed I interrupted a bunch, I apologize, and that kind of thing. So everyone kind of learns it's a learning process, so learn to be better participants, learn to be better facilitators. Um, and whether or not a person should be a group member, I think it depends on the issue. I think for, for us, we have all our facilitators are group members. Um, but when there's some big issue, we'll ask, we can ask an outside facilitator, yeah. Um, for like very heated things where we can't find a, a neutral facilitator. And then how much time does it take to train eight to 10 people plus a facilitator? I think it depends on those eight to 10 people. Um, but uh, I would say a lifetime on one hand. Um, on the other hand, to get started, I think just uh, um, have, you know, have one kind of, and you mean, you mean for consensus? Yeah, I mean, consensus. can you plan a half day training and be good to go for the next six months or two a year or? Is it really, does it really need to be more intensive than that to I be see. effective? I, I really think it depends on the individuals in the group because I feel like the, if, they're, if your group is, tends to be people who are really into cooperation or good listeners and tend to kind of um, have a, a certain level of trust, I think it's, it'll be easier to go there. If it's a group that already has some tensions um, and... Um, a big variety of styles, it might be harder. Although I would say that after a half day, I, uh, I would say you're good to go to start trying, right? As long as there's a room, you know, everyone knows that you're kind of like all learning as you go a little bit. But I think, I think a half day, again, it depends on the, <laughs> it depends on the people. Yeah. Um, any other questions or any comments about your experiences? And facilitation or consensus rather. Uh. I have found it helpful particularly when there are charged issues when the facilitator reminds people of the process of openness and you've used um, uh, uh, an analogy of backing up that I just found really really helpful. I'll just describe that really quickly, which is, um, so we recently had a discussion or are in the process of having a series of discussions around a particular um, a heated topic where people ve feel very strongly one way or the other. And, um, and I realized that people were kind of like, you know, let's say you're at a cross in the road and you, ha you can either go, you know, this way or that way. Um, and... And I feel like there's a bunch of people over here already and a bunch of people here already. And then you come into the room and, and so what kind of conversation are you going to have? You're like, no, no, I'm already over here. You come over here. And it's like, no, no, I'm already over here. Um, and so I ask people to kind of like imagine that they like walk, like imagine walking back to that crossroads and that we have to decide together. And it could go either way. Because um, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard when you're already invested in something. Um, to to kind of see and hear concerns as valid concerns, um, but I think it's really important in order to um, to to go there. Especially in I mean a community here, we we all live together and we all kind of have certain develop certain patterns and relationships. Um, 
and might kind of, oh, I never agree with that person, so I'm going to kind of dismiss them instead of being like, no, this, we, we, have to, we have to listen to each other um, and address concerns as if they're our own. Yeah. Is there a, a process that you use to get to that place? Um, because if you're talking about, you know, for most of us tend to You know, we, we sort of feel like, okay, this is where I'm at. This, these are my values. This is what right. I understand. So um, I guess maybe in your experience, having been doing this for quite some time, is there a process or is it just the whole matter of, of participating in it and you see people start to realize, like, okay, let me sort of soften my stance and really kind of open and then everything's not as intense in that moment. Does um, that make sense? So how, how to create an openness in the group? Yeah, I guess, yeah, that's, that's um, yeah, and, and does it take time, and does it evolve, or, um, I don't know if I'm being clear. The, the goal, the evolving being the, the openness of a group, for example, right. or, okay. I think it's, uh, I think it evolves, um, I think it goes in, it, it, it doesn't go, it's not a linear evolution, right? Yeah. Um, you'll have moments where there's like a feeling of group togetherness and cooperation and high level of trust and things will feel much easier um, because someone will propose something and no one's kind of questioning where is that person coming from they're just trying to do this or that um, it, it's really a feeling of oh yeah that sounds great yeah why not you know um, and then there will be moments where kind of if there's a new new folks coming in and they're not oriented so they have a different set of assumptions and they're like I don't get that like I don't you know and and it can create kind of a, a different dynamic in a group um, or even just personal infighting can create some kind of um, uh, kind of division and, and less openness I think um, I think it depends on the group and I think a lot of more um, humanizing of people, more activities where you're building trust, whether it's working together, right, going to a, um, work on somebody's garden together, um, or those kinds of things where you're actually working together and not just sitting in, in a room meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I think that helps. I mean, these are just, you know, some of my thoughts. If other people have thoughts on ways to keep people open and listening and, and maintaining Kind of an open, good relationship and respectful relationships um, in, in in that process. But I I do feel like facilitators have a play a big role in kind of setting the stage. If a facilitator is tired and kind of cranky and kind of like um, you know wanting to just like okay next person you know and isn't reflecting back like if you're if you're saying back oh you know I'm hearing you say this and I think it helps people feel heard and feel a little bit more able to kind of hear other people. If you're not being heard, then you're going to constantly just want to make sure your point is being coming across rather than being in a place of being able to receive information. So, I mean, there's a lot of psychology in there too, but it doesn't, you don't have to kind of figure all of that out to do um, uh, consensus decision making. And also, I think that um, I have a lot of experience in, in a work setting, but um, most of my experience is here in a and so there's a lot more personal stuff that you get through that you need to address, um, but it might not be true for kind of workplaces where it's much more kind of what the business issue is and, and it, it can be a little bit more depersonalized. Um, I don't know, I'm seeing some nods. <laughs> I have a question about the setting of the meeting because uh, um, in many work meetings where I've been over the years, uh, meeting or whatever you know, was my uh, job, um, <laughs> um, my boss or the supervisor used to um, bring food. <laughs> mm -hmm. He would say, you know, uh, bringing food helps, mm -hmm. talking and making decisions because everybody gets relaxed when he needs, essentially. So it just, uh, everybody starts the meeting a little bit more uh, mm -hmm. cheerful and relaxed and joyful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes having the meeting, uh, really in a restaurant, mm -hmm. or, you know, a lot of uh, business meeting happen in this setting. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? 
sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think that there's a particular uh, kind of formula for that. Um, I think it's, I think whether it's in the meeting or outside of a meeting is if, you know, food is obviously a, a nice way of sharing and building relationships with people, like breaking bread. Um. Uh, yeah, I've been at uh, some meetings where um, we started off by just having a check-in, mm -hmm. and we would just talk about like how our day was or how we were feeling mm -hmm. uh, before we got started. Yeah. It also helps. Um, I think that's really good. It helps when if someone's in a bad mood. Um, and you're saying, oh, I'm really tired or I'm in a bad mood, then if, if, you know, if you say something, people don't necessarily take it personally. They're like, oh, yeah, they're in a bad mood. It's not, they're not reacting to me personally. Sometimes it helps, right? Um, or if someone's just tired and they're not speaking up, you're like, why aren't they talking? They normally talk. Like, are they mad or whatever? And then, you know, it helps too. Let's say we're going to, we need to figure out where to have our re next retreat. Brainstorming is coming up with a bunch of different ideas, right? Um, or even like addressing a concern. Like somebody had concern about um, the location, or somebody had concern about, um, you know, uh, their food allergy. Like brainstorm is a place where you can kind of come up with ideas. I think the one one thing I would mention about brainstorms is that often I've seen brainstorms where people are like, okay, what are ideas that we have for this? And then you write a whole list of things like, uh, you know, we'll get some wheat-free stuff or whatever, like we'll um, have some, you know, rice or whatever. And then that becomes like the to-do list rather than it was just a brainstorm. These are just ideas. Not a, There's not, I mean, this is, a again, a simple one. But it, uh, like a more serious brainstorms can be like, Oh, um, let's let's have this action, um, this demonstration or something. And someone's like, "Oh, you know, we should have puppets." And oh, another says, "Oh, we should have um, do media." And you have this huge list that aren't, isn't really doable by like the number of people in the room, right? You have this huge thing, and people think that that's the plan. And so I think it's really important to kind of understand like the role of brainstorms and then figuring out what to do with that. You know, um, that's just one experience that I've seen happen a few times. I, I think what's interesting when you talk about the workplace and consensus is that mostly in workplaces um, there's a structure of hierarchy and if you're trying to introduce um, consensus decision making in that group you have to acknowledge the hierarchy right. that exists mm -hmm. and then also you know put it to bed before you do your consensus decision making. So I think that there are structures that are hierarchies that can make consensus based decisions. Um, you know, it's a little bit sloppier, but um, I think it's really important to, to understand the difference between the structure and the decision making, which um, can involve more consensus even in a real hierarchy. Um, like one of the things we do at the workplace is people put, you know, their, everybody wears badges at the county, right, with their position. and. Or, so you put them in the middle of the table before you even like start decision making, mm -hmm. and it's just a, it's a symbol of in this decision we're all equals. That's great. Yeah. Can you describe a little bit more who's in the room for for consensus? Um, we do consensus, but I could conceive that we decide oh let's let's have a just a voting if we want to just. Be quick about it. As long, I think as long as there's general support, if, if there's support for that, I think it's hard to, if you're c kind of creating a, a culture of consensus and then if you're feeling unheard in, <laughs> in the smaller group, then that, but I, I could see it happening, you know. It, and I, you know, there, just because we use consensus here doesn't mean that everyone's excited about it all the time. Some people are like, it'd be great if we could just make a really quick decision once, you know, like, um, <laughs> So there might be situations where it's like, you know, whatever, a small group that's like paint color, like, no, you decide, you know, or let's just do a quick majority, like quick vote. Okay, let's just go, let's go for that, you know. So, I mean, you can, I mean, you could even turn a straw poll into that if, if people are just wanting to make something quicker, just saying straw poll and then say, okay, let's make that the proposal. And if, if the people that are in the minority in that group are like, yeah, let's, let's just go for it because it's not worth kind of discussing further. I haven't seen it. If, I don't know if other people have seen that. So you have to decide what 
issues go to consensus and what issues mm -hmm. you're like, look. Yeah. Here's ten bucks. Go to home. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. Some things. I mean, that you have to know that even with just if all the entities are making consensus decisions, it's like it's really important to know who makes what decisions, right? So that's not going. That's like that's the worst case of like having everybody make every decision. Everyone's gonna hate, you know, meetings. No one's gonna show up. <laughs> And be like, I really don't care about whatever that you know that particular issue. And so if you if you're seeing that, then maybe it's just showing like you need to create smaller subgroups, or maybe one person cares a lot about something no one else really cares a lot about, and they're like, you could go run with it, you know, run with however you want to work that particular project. So I think consensus doesn't mean everyone has to be at every decision. It just means that there has to be agreement. Like you can empower, like there can be consensus to empower one or two people to implement something, right? So. Who would keep track of the decisions that are made? So uh, that can happen in a number of different ways. The way that we do it is that we have a note taker and we post all our notes on a public wiki. You all can look at those notes <laughs> as both tedious and or interesting as they may be. <laughs> have you ever had experience um, one group has a consensus style and then another group and then they come together? And trying to work together? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, in coalitions um, of, so I used to work for an environmental justice organization that we tend to be more, we were tend to, tended to be more consensus oriented and um, even though we had higher, kind of formal hierarchy because we're a nonprofit, um, and then coming in coalition with other groups, like some groups can make decisions really fast because the executive director's in the room with you and they're like, okay, let's make a decision. And we're like, no, we have to go back to our members. And, and if it's a big decision, right? If it's a small decision, but some things are like, oh no, we have to do go consultative. E you know, even if you're not consensus and you're, if you're a more democratic organization, sometimes you need to go back if you're, you know, to get, um, so. And it is challenging because there's people in the room who are like, why, why, you know, like, we need to make this decision right now or whatever, like, we don't have a long time. And so it is, it, it, it does create challenges. And so when you, what I found is that it's important to kind of set up those parameters up front, like the expectations. Like, we need, you know, two weeks, if you're going to make a proposal, we need two weeks to be able to go back. If it's an emergency thing and we recognize that it is, then we can make an emergency decision if it needs to be made. But um, yeah, setting all those things up ahead of time, uh, setting up expectations in any group uh, is always helpful. Uh, you're asking, are you asking the group? <laughs> I mean, yeah, if there's anybody else who feels like they know how to do it well, we're, we have very few people who, almost nobody, who, We've just been around for a while, and everybody who really knew the consensus process has sort of drifted out, or and now we've got a whole bunch of people we've just been meeting without using it, but that's how we were. Is it working? I mean, if it's working, that's great. If it's not working, then maybe... Well, no, that's why I'm sort of focused okay. on it now, is because okay. it's gotten to the point where people are, you know, not letting each other talk and yeah. don't really get that, you know, that, that there's a process. Okay. <laughs> One of the former residents here at LA Eco Village, Ron Milo, he's a professional facilitator. He helped us with a retreat. And it was really, really helpful. So we could we could talk a little bit more because I'm curious to hear what the dynamics are and if if the, your group is interested in consensus or if it's just a matter of facilitating um, whatever decision making process you already have. Because sometimes it's a facilitation issue, sometimes it's a consensus issue, and sometimes it's, it's both. Um, how do you handle accountability? Like if a committee forms to do something, and the next day they come back and nothing happened or pissed about it? I think you asked, my, my tendency is to ask the group. Like ask your group, how should we hold each other accountable? That's a, it's a hard thing in groups. I don't think that there's one way of doing that, but I think it's, it's up to the group because then there's buy-in on, on enforcing that, right? Um, uh, yeah, I think we're all, I mean, I think all groups, 
are kind of challenged in working through accountability. There are, if people have good experiences on what works. Um, otherwise, I think, yeah, I think it's kind of uh, the creative process of <laughs> knowing what that is. We, yeah, I think it happens very differently in different subgroups here at the Eco Village. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't have good examples. I mean, I, it, there is just kind of like the, um, just keeping everything transparent. So there is like the, oh, uh, there's, uh, people are gonna notice if I don't do something, so I'm gonna do it. If, if no one even brings up, if the notes aren't, you know, if who signed up for what isn't ever taking, you know, there's any, there's no tracking of that, then it's hard to do. But if there's a tracking of it, you, it could be as, as simple as have a conversation, like, oh, what, you know, what happened? Why didn't, why didn't that happen? And then just that process can be like, it can be helpful in either understanding why th there could be a good reason why something didn't happen, or it could be like, oh, we forgot, and whatever. I don't know if anyone else has thoughts on that. And there could be actual consequences if you, if you want to create that. There was one example, sorry, just on that. Um, it was just about being late. Uh, I was at a retreat where the facilitator, if you were late, then you had to sing <laughs> in front of everybody. And it was kind of like a funny thing, but it was also like, oh, no one wanted to be late. <laughs> um, so you could be creative about it. All right. Chair, the chair and approach versus the stick approach <laughs> right, right. is to, is to um, have treats that get put away when the meeting is closed. Right, yeah, you could have food, very limited amount of food at the beginning, and it's gone by the time. Oh, that's, that's very tricky. tricky. Box of ch a box of chocolate. And carrots, <laughs> carrots don't work. Actual sticks, actual carrots. Right. <laughs> All right, I think we're, we're at time. But thank you so much. I have a, just one more thing here. If, if you're interested in more resources, there's a ton on the internet. Here are a few that I like and appreciate. Um, and my email address is on the bottom. If you want to email me, I'm happy to. Um, are the websites <laughs> color coded and lo with lovely fonts? <laughs> <laughs> um, some of them are. Seeds, Seeds for Change is actually a really kind of interesting cute website that has like a, a little foldable pamphlet on consensus and it has like little mice and stuff it's very cute mm. uh, but they have a ton of handouts um, and resources and they're out of the UK um, but I found their their materials really accessible tree has facilitated she's a professional facilitator she's facilitated retreats here she has some good um, suggestions on there she has a lot of experiences with intentional communities um, so that's particularly good with groups like ours here. Uh, and I have a couple of books um, that I found helpful. It's just ones that I have, and maybe I didn't bring them. I will, I can share them um, if you email me. Uh, and there is a book called On Conflict and Consensus um, that's downloadable on that website. Thank you very much. Thank you.